Welcome to this Arnold Arboretum Tree Mob. I'm your host, Pam Thompson, Manager of Adult Education. Our topic today is beneficial predators for pest management. And our speaker is my colleague, Chris Copeland, who is greenhouse horticultural technologist. Chris grew up exploring the fields and forests of the Pioneer Valley of Western Massachusetts. He pursued a career in natural resources conservation earning a bachelor's degree in urban forestry and arboriculture at UMass Amherst. Internships at Smith College Botanic Garden and the Arnold in Arboretum introduced him to public gardens and their value around the world. After jobs as a climbing arborist in Boston and a grass tennis court tender on Nantucket, he returned to UMass Amherst to pursue a graduate degree in sustainable ag agriculture. His work on the plant production team at the Arnold Arboretum requires him to propagate, grow, and care for endangered, threatened, and otherwise important woody plants before they're planted in the Arboretum landscape. Thank you, Chris, for taking a break from your regular task and for sharing your experience with beneficial predators. Thanks, Pam, for that introduction. Um, I am standing here in the Dana Greenhouse plant production facility. Um, specifically, I'm in an area that we call the Shade House. This is a very uh, compact nursery. It's full of um, seedlings that are fresh out of our greenhouses. Um, they're not quite ready for our long-term tree nursery, so it's sort of a holding area where we get to evaluate cold hardiness and uh, acclimate these, these young plants to all the stresses that they'll see uh, in their permanent homes in the Arboretum. So as you can imagine, um, the diversity of plants that come through our production facility, um, all types of, of woody vines, shrubs, and trees. Um, with that plant diversity, we see a lot of insect diversity as well. Uh, and that's both good and bad, both pests and predators. Um, and about 20 years ago, uh, my predecessor, Bob Familetti, uh, he started our first beneficial insect program uh, in the early 2000s, this was a very forward-thinking uh, protocol uh, and initiative, and it sort of balances on two main uh, two main takeaways. And Bob certainly saw this uh, production facility as as not just an isolated area of plant production, but as part of a larger ecosystem, an agro ecosystem, if you will. And uh, he wanted to promote and encourage these natural pest and predator relationships, uh, natural checks and balances that occur across all ecosystems, um, but are certainly most important uh, in the agricultural setting. Um, these, uh, these natural pest and predator relationships really help to, to dampen the frequency and the severity of common pest outbreaks. Um, so it's really been a huge, uh, huge help for us having a small staff of about five people um, throughout the season, growing over a thousand plants any given year. Um, so these beneficial predators are uh, part of the staff, um, unpaid part of the staff, but they're a huge help um, to our, our pest management practices. And uh, another huge takeaway from this beneficial insect program is uh, to wean ourselves off of depending on uh, strictly chemical control methods of, of our pest outbreaks. Um, sometimes with with chemical applications, you can create secondary pest outbreaks by eliminating these, eliminating these predator insects, um, leaving the pests to really grow, um, sometimes out of control. Um, oftentimes, uh, as a worker, if you've ever applied pesticides, especially in the summer months, you know, wearing long pants, long sleeves, masks, uh, can be a very uncomfortable procedure. Obviously, if you're using uh, harmful chemicals, um, there's a risk uh, to the employee. So trying to integrate a biological beneficial control program with your chemical uh, and other cultural practices is, uh, is, a, is a good way to go. And uh, it's a great way to save costs and save uh, labor as well. So I'd love to jump right into talking about some specific pests. Uh, we have many pests here um, at the Arboretum, of course, um, but I wanna focus on two specific pests. And I'll start first with aphids. Uh, aphids are a very common insect pest. If you're a greenhouse grower, if you're an orchardist, uh, you are 
uh, quite familiar with these infamous uh, insects. Uh, and aphids are um, these soft bodied insects. And Pam, if you could throw on slide one, uh, I should have a picture of aphids that are feeding on one of our landscape plants. So aphids are these uh, wingless, uh, soft bodied insects. Um, there we go. We have a picture of a, a lily with a tiny yellow uh, population of aphids. Um, these occur on, on many plants from cabbage to phlox to woody plants in the rose family. And we grow many crab apples. I have a crab apple to my left here. Uh, many pyrus, pear species, cherries, of course, roses. Um, and our aphids also prey on other species outside of the rose family like viburnums as well. Um, so these are very persistent pests. They have these long piercing mouth parts that can puncture a plant cell and extract its contents and really cause um, some serious uh, deforming of foliage, uh, primarily a cosmetic, um, uh, cosmetic impact to your plants. I'm actually gonna try to show you a live colony of aphids if our uh, our Zoom is able to focus on this. This is a young um, cutting from a uh, small pear tree. And these aphids are collecting on some very succulent growth. Uh, aphids are most likely going to be congregating in colonies on the very green um, stems, your terminal growth, um, such as on this crab apple. Uh, they're gonna be on the very tip tips of the branches and trying to prey on the most vulnerable um, and young growth. So they can puncture these plants, uh, extract their contents, but they can also vector viruses such as the uh, rose mosaic virus and other mosaic viruses as well. Um, so for appearances, they, they do cause cosmetic issues, um, but they also detract from the vigor of these plants. And if you are a nursery, just like we are, um, we're trying to push plants through our production system within a certain time frame, and uh, these plants really need all the vigor that they can get. If we have a perennial aphid outbreak uh, year after year, uh, the plants really suffer. They don't get as large as um, we would like them to get in the small window of time that we have them. Uh, so it's, it's really important to be looking for these aphid colonies on a regular basis. We try to scout each Tuesday morning uh, as a team and we're inspecting each and every plant individually. Uh, we're looking on the underside of leaves, which is where you'll often find uh, aphid colonies. Like I said, um, colonizing on the green stems, but also that central vein of many leaves. It's like the, the local tap for these aphid colonies. Um, and they will be rather abundant if left unchecked. Um, Small aphid colonies, you can easily uh, squish them you know, with your hands mechanically or even spray them with a strong jet of water. Uh, but if you, if you let these insects go unchecked, uh, they can reproduce very efficiently. This is one of the mechanisms that make aphids such a, a nuisance pest. Uh, they, they give birth to live young, they give birth to mostly female aphids, and they can just replicate uh, at an insane rate. Um, which brings us to the need for having a preventative control. So let's dive into some uh, beneficial predators that help uh, control these aphid populations. First up, love to talk about ladybugs. These are certainly the most common uh, and most recognizable aphid predator. Um, Pam, if you wouldn't mind putting up slide two, do have a few pictures of some ladybug larvae. And we buy in our ladybugs uh, from a commercial vendor. We use Beneficial Insectary mostly, um, which is based on the West Coast. They will send us in the mail uh, within 24 hours, uh, a large bag of, of live ladybugs. In this image, you'll see the ladybug larva. The larva are extremely effective predators. They're the most active in their predation at the larval stage. The image on the left, you can see a, uh, a larva sucking the life out of a, an aphid. It's a great action shot in my opinion. Uh, but on the right, you'll see that these larva 
uh, appear like appear to be these like small alligator uh, appearances. They look almost nothing like an adult ladybug. However, each week uh, when we do our scouting, we'll find new colonies of aphids. Um, so if the conditions are right, they like today where it's it's mild. Um, ladybugs really thrive between 62 uh, and 88 degrees Fahrenheit, really hot sunny days, um, midday. It's really not a great time to be releasing ladybugs. Um, however, they come in large quantities, very cheap, very abundant. Um, so we'll basically walk around, we'll make note of where we see aphid colonies and really just sprinkle these aphids, I'm sorry, these ladybugs on these colonies of aphids try to get them as close to the food source as possible. You really only need maybe, you know, five to 10 uh, per colony, depending on um, the size of your plant too. So these aphid, these uh, ladybugs are extremely mobile. They will certainly require um, the right conditions. Like I said, uh, cloud cover, releasing them in the early mornings will really increase your chances of keeping them where you want them. Um, I'd say the one downside to ladybugs is how, how mobile they are and they have the tendency to disperse if they either don't have uh, enough of an aphid population to support them, they will certainly fly away and, and, and search for food. However, Pam, could you throw on slide three, please? Should be some, uh, some ladybug eggs. If you are, uh, scouting routinely, which I encourage you all to do so in your landscapes and in your growing areas. Um, you can be searching through these aphid colonies that you're aware of. And on the underside of leaves where you do see uh, these aphids preying on your plants, you should see some orange egg masses, which are uh, most likely ladybug eggs. There are other beneficials that do lay uh, orange eggs. However, uh, if you see these, uh, these orange egg masses around the colonies of aphids, uh, that's a great sign that you are providing a hospitable environment for ladybugs and uh, you are having success regenerating them. We have, uh, we do release a large amount of ladybugs per year. Um, and with that, we do tend to see uh, ladybugs naturally in our nurseries, um, in our surrounding vegetation, natural uh, landscape areas. Um, they'll find, find places to hide and overwinter, whether that's under the mulch where the soil is cool and has moisture for them. Uh, they will often um, find, find the right environments for them to be successful and come back year after year, um, or at least last throughout their season. Um, however, the, the one downside is of course their dispersal tendencies. Uh, so just be aware of that. And this will bring us to our second insect predator. Uh, Pam, if you could bring up slide four, please. Should be some green lace wings. So green lace wings are a great alternative, um, either to ladybugs or also using in conjunction with ladybugs. Uh, the green lace wings are weak flyers, so they aren't as mobile as ladybugs and are more likely to, uh, to stay in your growing area. Green lace wings are, uh, great generalist predators. They can prey on soft-bodied insect pests such as aphids, such as white flies, thrips, and, and other common insect pests. Um, like ladybugs, they are very aggressive as larvae, each feeding up to 100 aphids at a time. Um, so they are very voracious hunters. There are a few pictures of ladybug, or, um, of green lace wings right there. To the right are the larvae sort of an alligator appearance, similar to those ladybug larvae. And, and to the left is an adult green lace wing. They're about three quarters of an inch long. Uh, these very graceful insects. They have this net-like wing um, appearance, but I'll be honest, they are inconspicuous. Um, I haven't had any luck finding the adult green lace wings. Uh, and this is because they are nocturnal flyers. Um, they are weak flyers, but they will fly at night, um, so it's kind of hard to keep track of these uh, after that you release them, and we'll talk about releasing in just a moment. Uh, but if you are a homeowner, uh, these are naturally occurring insects, and they're attracted to porch lights at night, so you may be able to see these green lace wings 
um, that are attracted to your outside lights. Maybe they're on the screens of your windows at home. So keep an eye out for these little guys. Um, and like I said, they are most voracious as larvae, but you can also purchase them from commercial vendors like Beneficial Insectary, Arbico Organics, uh, and they come as live larvae, and they also come as eggs. And we prefer releasing them as eggs in their egg stage. They're a little easier to, um, to manage. The larvae are so good at hunting that they're actually um, cannibalistic. So purchasing uh, green lacewing larvae, they come in this very uh, bulky cardboard frame. Each of the individual larvae are compartmentalized and separated from each other. Uh, it's a great teaching tool, but it sort of uh, slows down the uh, application process, especially if you're you know, a commercial grower. Uh, it's very time consuming. However, we purchase their eggs. Uh, they come, again, within 24 hours uh, in the mail. And they will usually be uh, mixed in a, a bottle like this with some kind of organic carrier. Uh, these are in buckwheat hulls. They can also come in rice hulls as well. And this is just to prevent them from being compacted in the mail and being um, damaged in any way. Uh, so when you receive, if you receive green lacewing eggs, uh, they are um, kind of easy to, to work with. They actually change color when they are ready to um, Yes, I can show the label, of course. Hopefully you can see this. These are green lace wings, uh, a thousand count. They are eggs that are soon to hatch into larva. Again, they come in these buckwheat hull carrier, sometimes rice hulls, um, often acts as a food, temporary food source for when you are ready to release. And Again, they change colors when they're ready to hatch. So they come as green eggs. They'll slowly turn a dull gray color. And it's, it's often prudent to just let a few of these eggs hatch. Um, that way you're, you know that they're um, ready to feed uh, right after you release them. And similar to releasing ladybugs, you wanna do a topical application right at the sites of your aphid colonies. You don't have to go crazy, almost like you're seasoning food. Um, release a little bit at a time and you also want to just give the bottle a rotation that way your your beneficials are evenly distributed and you're still releasing beneficials at the end of your uh, release you don't want to be just releasing the organic carrier of course that's that's no help um, to your aphid populations so those are green lace wings um, again they are commercially available as well but they're also natural naturally occurring. Um, this brings us to our, our final aphid predator. Um, Pam, would you mind throwing on slide five? It should be a hoverfly larva. And I'd love to talk about hoverflies. Uh, these are, are not commercially available as far as I know, um, but I have read so much about them uh, through Cornell Extension, through UConn Extension, UMass Amherst has some great information on their websites about hoverflies. Um, I've heard about them in podcasts as well. Uh, and these, uh, you're looking at a picture of a hoverfly larva. That's a striking uh, larva. You can see some, um, some yellow and black striping. And this might be indicative of how they look as adults. Hoverflies are, uh, they have an appearance of a small wasp, but they are, they're not wasps, they are flies. Um, often called flower flies or surfid flies, and they are extremely um, great hunters as larvae. This picture was, uh, this larva was taken on, I believe, a crataegus, a hawthorn leaf, so it was feeding on a colony of aphids uh, on a rosaceous tree. Um, they are uh, very inconspicuous. I believe they fly during the day. I've never seen one in real life. It's very hard to uh, tell the difference between hoverflies and other flies in the landscape, but these larvae are extremely conspicuous. They really do pop out at you, um, maybe maybe three quarters of an inch, maybe a half an inch long, um, but they're great. They are uh, voracious hunters. I've heard that they are even more effective than green lace wings or ladybugs. And I wanted to bring them up because they are naturally occurring in our landscape. And um, you may ask yourself, you know, what can I do to 
um, create a hospitable environment for these natural predators like hoverfly and like ladybugs, like green lacewings. And you can start by, of course, thinking about your area as, as part of an ecosystem and thinking about you know, the, the tenants of, of having successful uh, natural populations, supplying food, water, and shelter. Um, of course, if you're purchasing insects, you wanna make sure that you do have the insect populations, the pest populations to support these, uh, these introduced hunters. Um, if not, of course, they will uh, either perish or, or fly away if they are migratory. Um, but if you are not in the market for buying insects uh, and you want to just encourage your, your landscape to be hospitable to these predators, um, you should really think about the biodiversity of your growing areas. Of course, we all have um, different contexts. You might be an orchardist, you might have only greenhouses and not much landscape to work with. Um, but I'll tell you a few things that we try to do uh, to promote healthy landscapes. Um, so of course we're part of the Arboretum. We have the luxury of having many uh, diverse landscapes uh, adjacent to our growing area, but on site we do a few things. Um, we do plant cover crops and these cover crops are of course primarily for soil health in our nurseries, but these cover crops are often flowering species and they provide essential pollen and nectar um, for, uh, for these beneficials to carry on their life cycles. Of course, pests aren't the only food source for, for predators. Um, they will need uh, some kind of flowering plants to, uh, to carry on and regenerate populations uh, and maximize their environmental services. So we are planting um, peas and oats is something we planted this spring. Uh, the pea crop does have a, a flower in early spring and having early spring flowers is, is definitely important. Uh, this is a time of the season where pest populations are still very low and probably not uh, enough to sustain these predator populations. Um, so having an early flower in the spring is, is prudent. Um, we are also currently planting a crop of buckwheat. Uh, the buckwheat adds some great biomass to our inorganic matter to our nursery soils. Um, but at the end of the summer, closer to the end of August, we'll have um, some flowers just to provide as a food source for predators like ladybugs and, and green lacewings. Uh, it's a tricky balance having um, flowering plants in a, an agricultural context. Um, so just, you know, find the balance that's right for you. If you are, um, you know, a, a grower with a larger landscape, maybe you're an orchardist, um, I would also suggest a technique such as creating no-mo areas and trying to uh, preserve these naturally occurring perennials, flowering perennials, like Queen Anne's lace, yarrow, uh, dandelions. These are all great food sources for these natural predators. Um, so just something else to think about uh, when, you're, when you're trying to curate these, uh, these agro ecosystem spaces. Uh, I want to move on to our uh, last topic, which is, of course, mite pests. Um, so aphids and mites are two, two of our most commonly occurring pests here at the, uh, at the Dana greenhouses. And mites are a little different. They're actually not, um, they're not insects. They are closer related to um, ticks and spiders. They're actually in the arachnids. They are... Um, very prolific, just like aphids, they, they can uh, really increase populations during hot, dry weather. We've had such a hot, dry summer here in the Boston area, and it's been very uh, conducive for pest populations such as spider mites. Um, you may have heard of these, uh, these important, rather infamous mite pests, such as a two-spotted spider mite, uh, the spruce spider mite, European red mites, and broad mites as well. Uh, these uh, many species of mites also have many hosts, uh, many plant hosts. So we have, uh, you know, a wide variety of woody ornamentals that can uh, that can fall prey to mite outbreaks, from arborvitaes to camisipris to red buds. Uh, it's really um, really hard to track down a pattern for uh, for what these mites 
are going to attack. So as part of our scouting routine, we do try to document each week uh, what species we're seeing mites on um, so that we can anticipate their occurrence uh, later in the season or for future seasons as well. So I wanna show you um, what kind of damage that, that mites can do. So mites have, mites have eight legs, just like um, ticks and spiders, but they also have uh, chelicera. These are these, these pincing mouth parts. Uh, they have the ability to uh, puncture the surfaces of leaves and cause um, these white speckling. So I'm gonna try to show you this rose. Uh, this rose had a pretty bad outbreak of mites earlier this season. Sorry if that's hard to tell. Um, but if you're scouting for mites, you wanna first notice the surface of the leaf. Uh, mites can cause many, many white dots, speckling, flecking. Uh, it's like a very, very unique to, um, to mite outbreaks. Eventually, if populations get bad enough, the foliage will turn yellow, um, start to be chlorotic and eventually fall off. Um, however, if you're scouting, uh, these mites are very small, very hard to see to the naked eye. So you wanna look for those foliar symptoms, but you also wanna look for um, webbing, hence spruce spider mites. They can often uh, create very fine webs within the foliage. Um, again, they're gonna most likely occur on your um, most actively growing stems, the ends of your, your branch tips, uh, that vulnerable foliage that's easy for an insect to penetrate. So look for that webbing. Um, the mites are going to be stationary. If they're feeding on plants, they're gonna be stationary. Um, I've seen them most commonly on that, that midrib, that central main vein of a leaf. Uh, and this is where they will lay eggs. They will create their webs. Mites are very messy, um, messy things. So many signs for you to be looking for during your scouting efforts. And you may be asking, how do I tell the difference between a pest mite and their natural controls, which are actually mites as well, these predator mites. Um, and the one uh, clarifying trait of, of a beneficial mite compared to a, a pest mite is their speed. So pest mites are stationary, they're feeding on a leaf, they're gonna be along that midrib, uh, but predatory mites, these beneficial mites are hunting. They're hunting for these pest mites, and you'll often see them sprinting across the surface of a leaf. Um, so when you're scouting, you, uh, you really need the hand lens to see what these mites are doing. And if you're seeing fast moving mites, then uh, there's a good chance you have a natural population of beneficial mites. And most beneficial mites, if not all beneficial mites, uh, they're in one family of mites, the phytoseed family may have butchered that name, uh, but I'm gonna throw some more Latin your way. Um, we use three several species within the phytoseid family of mites. Uh, we use a, a kind of a cocktail of these three mites at any given time during the season. Each have their own uh, specialty, their own role, and different optimal conditions for their success. Uh, so first up is uh, a mite called Amblyseus cucumeris. This is a uh, a very common mite, um, somewhat affordable. They are more of a cool season mite, uh, thriving between 66 degrees Fahrenheit and 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, it's a mite that we use in our greenhouses for most of the year, as long as the, the low temperatures in your greenhouse are right around the mid 60s. They're great generalist um, predators. They'll, they'll feed on pest mites, but they're also very successful at hunting thrips, which is of course a very common uh, common pest for greenhouse growers, those thrips. Um, and if your thrips populations are low enough, uh, cucumeris is a great alternative to keep those um, populations low and even to protect those plants as a preventative measure. Our second beneficial mite um, is, is a close relative, name is Amblyseus, I'm sorry, Amblyseus fallacious. Um, these mites feed primarily on, on pest mites, not so much on thrips like cucumeris does, um, but fallacious is uh, more, of a, more of a summer mite, thrives in the months of July and August. Um, they will um, 
be very successful in reproducing during these hot and dry months. And often they'll have, have success keeping up with pest populations. So they are efficient at reproducing and can keep up with, um, with your pest mites as well. And the third beneficial mite, again, is another relative uh, by the name of Amblyseus californicus. Um, these, these beneficial mites, I've noticed, are slightly harder to come across in terms of availability. Um, however, most of the time, um, they have the same availability as, as Cucumeris and Fallacious. The Californicus is a great late season mite. Um, they can thrive up to over 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, of course, that's the upper end of their, their hospitable range. Um, so I really wouldn't recommend anybody releasing beneficials at that heat, uh, at that amount of heat, um, whether that's in your greenhouse or, or outside. Those are really stressful conditions, um, but Californicus can can cover your pest mite populations at that uh, intense heat. Um, and if you're purchasing beneficials, you, you have one of two options, or you can use both options as well, like we do. Uh, you have a slow release method and you have a fast release method. So beneficial mites will also come in a, in a bottle. This is my green lacewing bottle, but it's, it's pretty much what you're gonna get for mites. Um, they come in larger bottles too. Uh, these mites will come in, again, in organic carrier, mostly bran or vermiculite. And uh, if, you're, if you're buying a fast release bottle, this is an instant release. You wanna be releasing uh, preventatively, but all around the canopy uh, of your plants. And you know we have, many species that we anticipate having spider mite problems. Um, so this is a, a great uh, fast release. If you have populations that are starting to get out of hand, um, have, a, have a fast release bottle and it should give you um, somewhat good coverage as long as your pest populations are at a, at a manageable level. If, if they're exploding, um, it may be too late to try to use beneficials, um, then you might have to you know, consider a chemical option. Um, but the slow release uh, mite application is a favorite of ours. They come in these sachets. I'll try to hold one up to the camera. So these are beneficial sachets. They are they have a, a resident mite population. You can get sachets for Cucumeris, Fallacious, and Californicus. Uh, probably other mite species as well. Uh, but those are the three that we use here. And in these sachets are our bran, pollen, it's a food source for the resident mite population in this bag. And over a period of four to six weeks, these mites will give birth to a new generation. And those young mites will uh, start to explore your plants and feed on, um, they'll persist on pollen. If you have low mite populations or no mites at all, um, but they will serve as a preventative protection. Um, we have many important plants that uh, we try to just have a, a base protection of, of predatory mites. I'm thinking of our uh, bonsai collection. We have many camisiparis that are you know, close to 300 years old, uh, and we know that they have common mite problems season after season, especially this time of the year. Uh, so we're always hanging these sachets um, throughout the canopy. You do want them to be, you know, somewhat protected. You want them to be in the canopy, not necessarily exposed to, you know, to the extreme sun uh, and those harsh conditions. Um, but for large plants, you can hang, you know, two to three. Uh, for smaller plants, uh, just one will do. Uh, and these sachets will also come on a stick as well. You know, if you're a greenhouse grower, maybe you're growing flowers or something, uh, some kind of smaller plant, uh, they'll have a stick instead of a hanging tag, and you can stick uh, the sachet right, um, right there in your container. And as long as it's within the vicinity of your foliage, these mites will, uh, will come out of the, the sachet and explore your plants. So those are a few methods that we have uh, to, to combat mites, um, to to protect our plants before mites really get out of hand. Um, again, you have the fast release option um, or a slow release as, as a preventative. Uh, so Pam, that's 
wraps up my presentation and I would love to throw it back to you and field some questions. Did you want to share that very last, um, the microscopic view of where those mites? Totally, yeah, let's throw that on there just so we can all look at a, a few mites okay. in a few different life stages. All right, so these are a few uh, microscope images. Uh, on the left, you'll see a uh, collection of, of eggs. Mites will give birth to, to live mites, um, usually a six-legged nymph, and they'll mature on to, um, uh, to an eight-legged mature mite. Um, and again, you'll see on the right, they are uh, crawling along that central vein, that midrib. They're laying eggs pretty much everywhere. Uh, like I said, they are super messy mites. Um, and again, they're, they're mostly visible through a microscope or through a hand lens. Um, if we ever have a suspicion of mite activity, uh, we'll collect the leaf, we'll throw it under the microscope and take a close look. It's a great way to figure out, are these mites pests um, or are they predatory? Are these the good guys or are they the bad guys? Uh, and mites are really hard to tell the difference um, between them. They are often you know, cream colored or translucent. Um, some actually take on the color of, of the prey that they're eating, so they can take on an orangey hue. Um, so they're really tough to ID, at least for me. Um, really only have been working with mites for a few years, uh, but uh, having a hand lens on hand for your scouting efforts uh, is, is a huge advantage. All right. Um, would you like me to show the uh, beneficial insect slide as well? Yeah, we can throw that on there. It might even um, generate some questions. I wanted to throw together this chart. Uh, it's sort of a helpful reminder for me to, to kind of keep track of uh, our popular, our favorite beneficials and uh, the mites that they, I'm sorry, the, the pests that they individually control for. So you can see there's a, an overlap of, of control, which is really what you want. If you're starting a beneficial program, um, you, you want to release a, a cocktail of beneficials. That way they're, um, they're overlapping, they're providing control. And if one species of, of predator maybe isn't doing so well, it's not the optimal conditions you know, in your greenhouse or, or outdoors, uh, then you have other, other beneficials that may be providing the same services. Um, so I, I have a long list of predators there, some I didn't even talk about. Uh, we have Delosha, rove beetles uh, for fungus gnats in greenhouses. Uh, we have many other, uh, many other beneficials. Aureus is a great um, thrips control, um, but again, trying to use uh, several, several mites that have the same, uh, provide the same services. Uh, it's a great way to, uh, to really encourage these, um, these beneficial relationships. And uh, again, you, wanna, you do want to make sure that you have the, uh, the pest populations to merit buying these insects and releasing them. Um, that's the, the key to success. They need, they need the food, they need the shelter. First, I'm just going to ask you a question that came in before the uh, webinar from Texas about scale. Uh, mm -hmm. This woman has scale in a greenhouse on orchids. Um, she can treat them manually, but and she has a company come in and uh, spray for them, et cetera. But what are your recommendations, if any, for um, a beneficial predator or treatment for these? Totally. So, so scale is a, a tricky insect. You really have to get the timing right. They have of course, armored protection, many scales do, um, but they all have this crawler stage where they uh, tra are traveling to new sites, um, new plants, et cetera. And depending on what species of mite you have, I, I recommend you know, looking up when this crawler stage is for, these, uh, for this scale. And the crawler phase is a soft bodied um, phase. And this is when uh, beneficial like ladybugs can often come in handy. Uh, ladybugs are, are great generalists. So are green lacewings. They're generalists and they can feed on, on scale as well. Um, but if you're in a greenhouse, you want to consider, you know, the temperature conditions, the humidity conditions, and just, and just double check that um, you're going to have a uh, hospitable environment for your beneficials. 
what we do for scale, um, whether it's hemlock elongate scale, something that we're scouting for all the time. Uh, we often opt for a chemical application, but instead of doing, uh, you know, a hort oil spray, which can often have negative impacts on, on beneficial um, pests, sometimes we'll do a, a drench, such as Safari, Dynatefrin. Uh, we'll do a localized drench. We're only applying that individual plant. Often we'll remove that plant from the area. That way, any moving beneficials um, don't don't catch wind of those those insecticides. Um, so, removing your your problem plants from the general area, maybe doing a localized application like a drench, um, is a is a great way to um, protect your surrounding beneficials as well. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah. Um, could you repeat the organizations that you mentioned where you've purchased beneficial insects? Absolutely. Uh, our go-to has been Beneficial Insectary. They're based out of California. Um, they have a wide range of beneficials. Um, some, you know, this year being, being kind of a kooky year, um, availability is somewhat uh, lagging. So you kind of want to know several weeks in advance what you're looking for for beneficials. Um, but Beneficial Insectary has a great website. They have a retail website where you can buy uh, and read about these beneficials, but they also have just an informational page. It's called greenmethods.com, G-R-E-E-N-M-E-T-H-O-D-S.com. Uh, it's, it's a wealth of information. It's something I've used throughout the past couple of years to learn about um, beneficial predators. So they're a great, uh, they're a great company, great customer service, um, and you'll, you'll get your stuff uh, in a timely manner. We also use Arbico Organics. This is a, uh, another retailer. They're based out on the West Coast as well. We use them a little less frequently. Um, if a, an insectary doesn't have what we're looking for, we'll often go to Arbico Organics and get what we need. Um, most recently, we purchased uh, beneficial mite from them uh, by the name of Persimilis. Uh, it's a little red mite, they're super fast, and they're great for, for spider mites. Um, so Arbico Organics came in handy uh, in the clutch when we needed them. And for the East Coast, this is a place that we don't use frequently, but you know, it's something I'm, I'm thinking more and more about just to diversify um, our sources, is a place called IPM Labs. Uh, I don't know too much about them, but I know they're based out of New York State. So I encourage you to maybe check out their website as well. That's IPM Labs in New York. Um, you know the black stuff on woody plant stems? Someone is asking about that. Yes. Is that um, mites? What is it? This is particularly um, looking like soot on azalea and Andromeda. Totally. That's a great question. Uh, I was hoping somebody would ask about that. So <laughs> what you're seeing is honeydew and aphids will excrete this like sugary sugary mess. It's called honeydew. Um, when you're scouting for aphids, um, of course you're looking at the stems and whatnot, but the honeydew will be excreted from aphids. It'll drop onto the lower foliage and the blackness is actually, uh, it's a fungus that's colonizing that sugary exudate um, by the name of sooty mold. It's, it's really just a cosmetic issue, um, certainly messy and, and kind of uncomfortable and it'll reduce the photosynthetic activity of your leaf, um, but it's mostly cosmetic. Um, and another point on honeydew, um, when you're scouting for aphids, you'll often see ants crawling around these plants and ants will essentially try to farm colonies of aphids and the ants will consume that honeydew, um, maybe before it turns to sooty mold, um, but they'll consume that honeydew as a food source for the ants, black ants, and in return, they provide protection for those aphids from other natural predators. So um, I'm not recommending you go and smash every ant that you see, but uh, it's a great indication that you, you might have a, a building aphid population. Uh, you haven't mentioned praying mantids at all. Mm. What's, what's the deal with those? Um, so we, we really don't use praying mantis but I know that they are extremely aggressive. They're generalist. Um, 
generalist predators. Um, I don't know much about their hospitable conditions, but I've seen them naturally occurring. I've seen them over at Weld Hill, um, the research facility of the Arnold and their common garden. It's probably something you'll see in other community gardens as well, but they are, they are great generalist predators, good for aphids, good for thrips, um, maybe even uh, soft-bodied scales as well. I think you mentioned this, but um, the dry, hot summer is increasing the aphid population this year, correct? Um, it could be. It depends. If hot and dry weather uh, is primarily great for mite populations. Um, I don't know if aphids respond well to, to the dryness. Um, aphids are attracted to the young, vigorous growth, so I would even suggest uh, in a wet year where your plants are putting on a lot of new growth, especially throughout the season, you would see more aphids on uh, maybe a season with higher rainfall. Uh, when your leaves sort of get older mid-season, they become less palatable for, for aphids. And that's when they'll jump from, from your woody plants to maybe your herbaceous plants, like weeds that you may have um, growing in your area, in your greenhouse or in your tree nurseries. Um, so I'm not sure if they like hot and dry weather, but dry weather is great for, for mite populations. So they might be seeing mites rather than aphids. Possibly. Um, possibly. Buy yourself a hand lens. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Identify your enemy, right? Exactly, exactly. <laughs> um, we're almost done with questions. Um, are these predators also efficient for pests in vegetable gardens? Yeah, I would say so. Um, I, I'm not a vegetable grower. I've, I have some experience, but I know aphids are, um, are really common, things like cabbage, uh, but totally. I would say uh, all of these predators that I've mentioned, they work well for woody plants, but they're also going to work well with probably any crop that you may have that has uh, aphid pressure or mite pressure. Um, I want to underscore, you know, what are the, what are the habitable what are the hospitable conditions for these predators? And you know, you want an area uh, with shade. You want them to have some type of, of refuge from stressful summer conditions. So if you have a vegetable garden, you may have these, these predators do really well um, under their canopy, under the shade. Uh, if you have uh, a dense, vigorous vegetable garden, I'm sure there's plenty of shelter for all of these predators. Um, does horticultural oil harm the beneficial insects? Uh, I would say so. I think um, hort oil is kind of a broad, um, sort of has a broad impact on the landscape. What you're doing is you're basically suffocating um, your, your target pests. Um, and just like many other insecticides, other chemicals, um, you're going to have an impact on your beneficials, which is a great uh, it's a great reason to think about where you're applying chemicals before you do so. Um, so you should really remove your, your pest plants um, for, um, from your general population. That way you're not impacting uh, that general predator population as well. So I would say it will, it will have an impact. So use it sparingly and, and use it wisely. All right. Well, I, I have one question myself, which is when you're mm -hmm. Um, you said you're planting cover crops, so yeah. to help uh, create a more uh, healthy environment for all of these predators that you want. Mm -hmm. um, do you then turn that in, like with a rototiller, or what do you do with those crops? Totally, yeah. So the cover crops, uh, just to talk a little bit about them, um, we're primarily planting these cover crops in areas where trees have been dug up in the springtime and planted out into the arboretum. So we have these fallow areas in the tree nursery. Um, so these cover crops are to, of course, provide um, an input of organic material into the nurseries um, for soil health. Uh, we wanna decrease the competition of weeds as well. So those are some services that the cover crops um, provide. But of course, if you're planting something that flowers um, even if it doesn't flower, it's going to provide a, some dense um, vegetation for these beneficials to uh, find shelter. So yeah, we do till them in um, basically right before these, these crops go to seed. So in terms of buckwheat, we're growing buckwheat right now. 
um, something Bob Familetti used for years. Uh, we try to use it midsummer just because it germinates so readily. Um, so we'll, we'll wait until they flower and we'll try to till them in because buckwheat just seeds really well, propagates really, really easily. Uh, it can even become sort of weedy in future seasons if those seeds are, are germinated. So um, we wait till they flower, give them maybe a few days, but before the flowers turn to seed, uh, we till that in. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great. All right, I think that does it. And um, thank you so much, Chris. This was really helpful. I hope all of you listening will um, attempt to put some of these practices into play. And thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate this. Thanks, Pam. All right, take care, everybody.